After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen. Blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God now, forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and worship him today, worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Here is the second lesson. The Holy Gospel for today is taken from the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. As you know, the Greek word anastasis for, for resurrection means literally stand up, which is why we stand for the reading of the gospel. In this Easter season, let us stand for the reading of the gospel. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all of these, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray for the blessing of the Spirit to anoint the word. Settle over us, Holy One. Be among us. Fill our hearts with your spirit that this would be your word to us today. Bless and grant a blessing upon all the words, songs, thoughts, and prayers of our hearts. Amen. In the popular movie, Legally Blonde, Elle Woods, played by the beautiful Reese Witherspoon, is, um, has gone to Harvard Law School to pursue her man. He left her for something else. And prior to going off to Harvard, she never really thought of herself as anything but beautiful, popular, and up for the good life. But when she gets to Harvard, she's not well liked there. People don't understand her. She's very different than everyone else. And they sort of shun her and mistreat her. And early in the movie, they invite her to a party, but because they don't like her, they tell her it's a dress-up party, a costume party. So she gets to the party, and everyone there is dressed in regular clothes, and she's dressed as a Playboy bunny. A little bit embarrassing. There are situations in which it matters how you dress or what you wear. In the text from the book of Revelation today, we learn just this very thing. First of all, I want to tell you that there's no S on the end of Revelation. It's, that's because the whole entire book is considered to be one unified witness to the Christ. And also, it wasn't written by John the Apostle, just for those of you who like to know these kinds of things. The language and the theology doesn't work for that. 
Theologians today recognize it was written by John of Patmos, which is a way of saying we don't know anything more about this particular John than that he was exiled to the island of Patmos. But John of Patmos tells us this. Those who were being saved, the saints, that is little s, were standing in front of the throne, before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were robed in white, and they were carrying palm branches. Now, that's actually a very important thing to say, a very important clue. Because the truth is, you cannot stand before the powerful throne of God unless you are robed in this white robe. And that white robe is a signification that you are righteous enough to be in the presence of God. And there's only one way to get there. That robe is connected to your baptism, but it means that it has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, there you have a great mystery, don't you? If you're like me, every garment that you've ever seen that got touched by blood never really was completely white and pure again. And, and even if it looks pure to the naked eye, you put it under a microscope and you can find that those particles of blood are still in the garment. I learned that from NCIS. <laughs> it's my source of all forensic knowledge. But it means that this is a mysterious thing, this idea of a robe white washed in the blood of the Lamb. It requires us to recognize that our salvation is not of human making, that it comes at the hand of God, and that, in fact, it defies the laws that we think define our reality, and that it is very different than what we would have concocted, because what makes us possible for salvation is that we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's a gift from the Lamb. It is not our doing. Years ago, when B.C. was still around in the, in the Sunday morning um, comic strips. I love that comic strip. And one Sunday, Easter Sunday morning in the 90s, they had a very powerful one that I clipped out and hung on my bulletin board. And it was on my bulletin board for years and years until it just became a rag. I mean, it just sort of began to fall apart. I think I have it in a drawer somewhere. It depicts the cross on the top of a hill. And the cross, from the cross is coming this great flow of blood. And it comes down and creates a river. And there's a woman washing, bathing in the river. Exactly right. To be saved is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's a gift from God. It belongs to God. It's power of God. It is not our doing. We don't dispense it. We don't control it. It is not in our hands. The only thing we need to do is to be willing to be washed in it. John of Patmos goes on then to describe many images which are very powerful for the nature of salvation and also for God's eternal intentions for us. The first thing that we see in this nature of salvation is that it is a huge, vast number of people who are brought to salvation. So many that it can't even be counted by the angels. Now stop and think. That's a pretty big thing to say. The angels have all of eternity to count. That must be a pretty large group of folks. It probably means that there's no need to count or score anymore. Heaven is the one place that when someone says, but who's counting? No one is counting. It's just this magnificent number of people. In the text that comes right before this text, John has told us that there will be 144,000 Jews. Now, that is not a literal number. It's a representative number. We know this because 144,000 is a multiple of 12, like the 12 tribes of Israel. And 12 to the Jews was a perfect number. It meant a perfection that God has made. And to apocalyptic writing, 12 is a number which is representative. So 144,000 means this great, vast number of people that God has chosen that is the exact number that God wants to bring. And those are just the Jews. <laughs> then you come to this next group that we have in this text today, so vast that it can't even be counted by the angels, and they're from every land and every tribe and every language. They are as different from each other as they can possibly be. The one thing they all have in common is they're wearing the robe. They're wearing the white robe of salvation, the gift of salvation washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
It's a reminder to us that if we really want to be like God intends us to be, if we want to be like heaven and be that group that is in living in God's intention, we have to be open to the diversity and the difference among us, to the old and young, to different races and different ages and different genders and different economic groups. When we look out over the church and we see that loving embrace of diversity, we know that we are being as God has called us to be. We are looking the way that God intends us to look and we are preparing for what it will be like when we walk in the corridors of heaven. Then John goes on to explain what you do in response to this gift of being brought into salvation. John describes it this way. Before the throne, standing, were the elders and the angels and the four living creatures and those robed in white, and they all fall down on their faces and worship. The appropriate response to salvation is worship. We worship God because God is worthy of our worship and praise. That's what you do when you have this certainty that the one who died for you brings you into salvation. It is the only logical response, and it reminds us of how powerful and important this very event is because it not only prepares us for what heaven is going to be. If you don't like to worship, you might be kind of out of place in heaven. It might not seem much fun to you because it's what happens in heaven. Not only does it prepare us for eternity, but it is also a foretaste of what it's like to be in eternity. It is also why the power of worship isn't found in its style. We can worship with an organ leading us, or the praise band, or in this case, a shovel. We can worship with liturgy or with not very much liturgy. What grounds our worship is that God, the risen Christ, is present with us. Do you not remember? That he said, wherever two or three of you gather, I will be there. And whenever we know of the presence of our Lord and we raise our songs and our hearts in praise to him, that's worship. And that's what undergirds our very life. John goes on to describe that even though God is worthy of worship and so we do it simply for that pure thing, in the end we also receive much from this business of worship, from this joy of worship. It is the benefits of gathering for worship. Nancy Cheatham tells about her sister's new car. It had lots of fan, fancy technology and other kinds of things. And she said the first time her sister drove it in a rainstorm, she turned a knob expecting to get the windshield wipers. It wasn't the windshield wipers, but this thing flashed across the dash that said, drive 360 degrees. Well, obviously, she didn't know what that meant. Do you know what that means? So she, when she got home, she um, looked in the manual, and it turns out that when she turned the knob, she shut off the internal compass in the car, and it could no longer sense what direction it was going. And in order to get it set again, she had to drive in a perfect circle, because then it would once again know which direction north was. When we gather for worship, we worship God because God is worthy of our worship. But it has powerful benefits to our lives as well. And one of those benefits is that it resets our God compass and gets us going in the right direction again. If your life is confused and you don't know where you're headed and you don't know what you're supposed to do, come to worship and somehow God and others will be at work. And maybe God through others will be at work to help you write yourself, to figure out what it is that life is supposed to be. John describes this benefit of worship in this way. The one who is seated on the throne, which the throne is always an image for God. The one who is seated on the throne sheltered them and saw to it that that no one needed to be fed, that everyone had food and everyone who was thirsty was given drink, and the sun didn't strike them, and the lamb guided them to life, and God wiped away the tears from their eyes. All of those things are parts of Jesus' mission and ministry that he claimed and came to do, that he claimed for himself. And there are also promises revealed in the Old Testament. For example, that not having want, everyone being fed and sheltered and having water, right out of Psalm 23. Did you make the connection? And the sun doesn't strike you comes from Psalm 121. 
And the image of God will wipe your tears from Isaiah 25, that powerful text in which God promises that once and for all the shroud of death will be lifted, that death will no longer have the last word, that death is not the one that has the say anymore. All of those promises are kept in Jesus. We see them kept in his death and resurrection. That which has been promised was kept through Jesus. And whenever you come here, you have the benefit of knowing that and being encouraged to live in it and to believe it. So that it turns out that when you come to worship, three powerful things are happening. You are joining with the whole host of heaven, all those who have gone before you, and every other person across the world who is raising their voices of prayer. You're a part of that magnificent throng of people, too many to count, who are praising the Christ. You are also making a commitment to the mission and ministry of this Christ, a commitment which you witness to by your very presence. Every time you come here to this place, you are saying to a doubting world, there's something powerful happening here. It is connected to the fact that Jesus died and is raised, and it is connected to the fact that we experience salvation through the one who died for us. That's your witness. And you take it not just in this place, but you take it with you into your world. And it, because the Christ himself is present, the other thing that comes to you in worship is comfort. In the movie Shadowlands, which is based on the life of the great Christian thinker and writer C.S. Lewis, there's a very powerful scene <clears throat> in which Lewis has been to London, and now he's returning to Cambridge, where he teaches. While he was in London, he married his sweetheart, Joy Grissom. Joy was an American woman, and she had cancer, and she was dying. And it was during their struggles, as she is dying of cancer, that they realize how much they love one another. And so they're married in a private Episcopal ceremony at her bedside, as she is very near to death. When he returns from London and he comes back to Cambridge, the first person that he runs into at the school is his friend Harry Harrington. Harrington is an Episcopal priest, and he knows the situation that um, C.S. Lewis has been in with Joy, and so he asks him, what news do you have? And C.S. Lewis hesitates for a moment, and then he decides to talk about the wedding instead of about Joy's upcoming death. And so he says, it's good news, Harry, good news. But Harry didn't know about the wedding. He only knew about the illness. So he assumed that C.S. Lewis was saying that Joy was better. And he says to him, I know how hard you've been praying about this, and now God is answering your prayers. And Lewis says, Harry, that's not why I pray. I pray because I need to. I pray because I need help. I pray because my need for help flows out of me night and day when I'm sleeping and when I'm awake. I pray because I need God's help. It doesn't change God. It changes me. To come into the presence of the living Christ on any time that we gather is always the blessing of comfort because you are connecting with the one who is life, who brings life who loves you with life. And finally, the text tells us that we have something to do. It is when we give our lives and entrust everything that we have and everything that we are to the Lord, then everything that we do becomes part of the work and mission and ministry of the Lord. When we let Jesus' ministry be our point in life and be a part of everything that we do, it becomes the purpose of our occupation and the occupation of our purpose. And it changes our reason for living. Everything that you do in your life can be done to honor and glorify God, can be done as a piece of your worship, can be what takes this event here, which encourages you and to which you witness to the Lord of life into a world that is broken and wondering what's the big deal about all this stuff. So it turns out that there are times when it matters what you wear. And I don't mean this stuff, jeans or dress clothes or nice sweaters or nice scarves. I mean it matters that you wear the white robe of salvation, the promise that you too will be reclaimed in salvation. 
that gets in touch with the power of your baptism for day-to-day -day living. And when you do that, it gives you your purpose in life and the thing that you do, which is simply to live in that promise. So put on the white robe and live in it and get to work. 